remember coming to this ground and sitting at the top there when Bob Blanchard broke his leg in this goal here. I remember the, the noise of his, him breaking his leg. I could hear it up there, clack. That would be something lovely to do with my son, to have those great memories, coming to the game with my dad and just talking about football and being with other men and watching the game and the excitement. It was just a, brilliant to have a sense of tribalism and definition and to feel like you belong with all the people that are here and they're like all your brothers, you know, it's great, it's, it's a really good feeling. It seems like this is as much as my family home because it seems like so much of my life is in here and I consider myself to be an Evertonian more than anything else, more than a musician, more than a man, I consider myself to be an Evertonian. I remember crying my eyes out and then just picking my guitar and writing that song straight away and everybody thought it was about a woman. Whenever I play it, I say this is a song about football because football can break your heart like a woman can't. So I, I always think about it when I'm writing songs. consolidated fourth place at the Premiership table. Norris lacked the firepower to do anything about the deficit and Everton clearly had done enough. But it wasn't pretty, but it's a vital win for the Toffees. I can't actually remember much of my childhood before I went to Holland when I was nine. I don't know why that is. It's all a bit cloudy. But when I, I remember going to Holland, I remember um, I remember driving in the middle of the night and thinking that I'd never see my friends again. And I remember learning the language and being able to speak Dutch within two months. And a whole part of me just didn't translate to that foreign language. And only 10% of who I was was coming through. And so I kind of felt lost. From an early age, I felt lost. Altijd, um, altijd heet, altijd uh, geen water en nee. altijd dorst hebben. Ja, klopt. Altijd heel hard lopen. Ja, ja en jouw huis was daar ja. en de mijne was dan daar. Zo ongeveer even tussen. ver, ja. Fietspad ertussen, ja. Ja, klopt. Ja, winkelcentrum, ja. ja. Daar, nou ja, hier had, <coughs> ja, hier had ik voetbal gespeeld. Ja, dat was wel leuk. We don't even know why we are friends and we became friends. I don't know. In a way, we're opposite. But on the other hand... Uh, we're the same? We're the same. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's deep. That's really deep. Yeah. In the Zen moment there. Hey, yo. I got to go a lot to go parties. Everything is nothing. Yeah. Hip-hop is everything. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. You don't know either. I spend a lot of time in this, this, these two windows that's here at the top of my, my bedroom and I had my own door into that room. I, I wasn't seeing my parents hardly ever and they were always in the, in the bar and um, doing drugs and stuff. And um, I guess it was the first time I really felt like I was alone and that I didn't really, that I wasn't really coping well with that. And there was nobody there to kind of give me any answers or give me any guidance apart from maybe Sherlock.
those are the main memories that I have really of Holland just being with Sherlock and walking around and listening to music and buying records every week and just trying to make sense out of feeling a little bit on the edge and the outside started taking it seriously I was 20 I'd been married I'd been married about six or seven months and I was struggling with myself a little bit so I was writing poetry and trying to express myself and um, I remember writing a poem and thinking oh that that maybe worked to music that sounds like it might be a song so I wrote Mood Indigo the songs basically that were on the first EP I wrote those and I, I still don't understand how it happened but um the tape of those songs got into the hands of this guy in Leeds. He had a record shop. And then it's all just kind of snowballed. And I feel lucky and humbled by the fact that we've been able to make the records we have because I just keep sitting here thinking, how does a guy with almost no talent and no musicianship get to make six records? Yeah. It's a bit odd. OK, well, we'll go again, yeah? OK, it's jingle time. On Radio 2, it's jingle time here. I never really wanted to be in, in a band. I always feel like the whole thing's been a mistake and someday somebody will realise that and ask me to stop playing the guitar. Adam Wackton's musical mystery tour. This is actually the nearest piano to my house, even though it's technically 90 miles away. Pretty much everything I've done has been thought of on this piano, which is very out of tune. But um, I play this piano. I quite like to have this piano in my house. I'd like them to sell it to me because it's the piano that I've written everything on that I've ever done. So, so whenever I'm here, I tend to play things, um, and then I write them down like this because I can't write music, and that's quite bad. The song happens and I feel it, but if I can't remember what the feeling is, I, I lose it. It's lost.
I don't think that I'm a musician per se. I think that I just have an ability, if anything, a very bad ability <laughs> to um, to just express something that I'm feeling at that moment. And um, I should start writing down what it was, <laughs> what I was concerned about, because then if I could bring it back in my memory, that would work. I write in this room because it's where my guitar is and it's where this couch is. Um, I used to write in my bedroom, but we have a spur we have this different room now in our new house. Um, mainly, I write in America as well because I feel like I belong there. Like I like the way it makes me feel, like things I see. I like small town America where you can just stop and sit around and watch things go by. So I, I just pretty much write in those two places, and I write at Riverside. I only ever write as a response to something, so it's a complete catharsis for me. It's never controlled, it's always like an outpouring, and I just start playing and then I start just singing out what I feel, and that's the only way it can work for me, because otherwise I'm not interested. I never pick up my guitar just to play, because it's like my guitar. I, it's, for me, it's a, it's a tool just to push something out, because otherwise I just go crazy. So. I like I normally go to David's house and we talk about the chord progressions and see what might work and talk about um we'll talk about arrangements and I'll tell him the sorts of things that I'm feeling and seeing and the kind of mood I want to set and then we kind of make some notes and start doing some general ideas about the song and then at some point we record it step by step Thank you. 
そうなんですねThat as well. Yeah, that's that's kind of that's very because I like the switch between that. A little mariachi band going in the back. Yeah, lots of uh, lots of. You could go brass mad on that. Well, you could. Yeah. So that I'm thinking about that quite a lot. Yeah, because that could be like one of those really long coda things. Exactly. That you just keep going on. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Once you get a certain number of songs, then it starts looking like a record rather than just odd songs. They can affect each that's, other. That's when we need artwork, <laughs> titles. In fact, I don't remember any of them. I don't know that Ferris Wheels of Winter is that song. Do you? I don't. No. But I just think Ferris Wheels of Winter, great title, David. Fantastic. Well done. See, that's probably where a lot of time True. gets wasted. We yeah. discuss the songs and we're probably talking about different... We don't really know what songs we mean. No. And he'll be saying, yeah, that song with the... And it'll say, say some title that you may or may not have just thought of and not actually And you're, tell you're working on and a complicated like, brass part on your head and then when I actually mention <laughs> the song is, you go, oh, just erase yeah. that. Not erase. needed. <laughs> Different song. You realise that it costs all this money going to the studio and... The majority of the time you know, you're sitting around drinking tea. Well, that's the <laughs> thing. The, the way we do it now is a lot better. It might, I mean, we, if we record the drums in a room or somebody's house, it's not perfect with all the microphones in the soundproof drum room. I'm sure it's not recorded brilliantly and there's all sorts of mm. noises in it, but it actually matters what you're playing. I think the producing it is everything. You do it as you go along. It's not like a separate thing. So it's kind of more, more knowing what you need or what a piece of music needs for it to be done. The production's kind of invisible. I'm not allowed to do anything. That you I actually like put, doing. Yeah, but I, well, no, but I kind of like it in a sense that, um, it's more focused. It's quite, and it, well, it's, it's a collaboration. It's not like I'm doing a, a thing and I can do what I want. We're mm. collaborating, aren't we? Mm. So, I tried to convince David that this is as much his his band as mine, but he's not having it. Well, no, I don't. It is your thing. Yeah, but I don't like to think that it's my thing. Yeah, I know. Well, I know. Yeah, but I know if I wake up tomorrow morning and think oh, I'm not doing it anymore, that you would go, "Oh, please, Chris, don't. Please, I need to go to Sweets. Brilliant." <laughs> but it's, I still think it's nice for me to think that we're like a gang rather than like, "Oh, it's just me all the time." Gang. Gang. Duo. Mm. Yeah. Well, gang. gang. Three is three a gang? John. Don't know. Colin. Not sure. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Huge gang. Before you came along, if it wasn't wood, I, hadn't, I would absolutely <laughs> not consider using it. So it is good that he brings things that I wouldn't consider and, and tries to get me to listen to music that I eventually, a year later, decide is actually pretty good. But essentially the relationship's really about films and comics, isn't it, books? Films, comics and books. All I knew was he actually lived at the bottom of my road. So I went and saw him, and then obviously it turns out he's an incredible drummer and he's up for, and he's up for a Grammy, but this, the logic for me is still the same. He lives at the bottom of my road, and if he'll play, I'll use him. And he's been around ever since, really. 
Right. Is there another microphone we around? <laughs> Basically, Chris's songs, all his songs are slow. You know, they're all very slow. I remember the first time I turned up to play with Chris for the very first time. Um, I couldn't believe how slow his songs were. And I was, you know, the first time I was playing them, he kept saying, no, man, slower, even slower. And I'm going, you're choking, you know? Most of the songs we tend to start off where we get an idea of what we want to do with it. And then we'll get, like, scaffolding, which will either be drums and guitar or piano and drums or something that's just like a structure that you can work on and then that's like your palette and then after that you can think right well, how's about some brass on here that sounds like this and we'll try it like this i bet if you added up all the time it takes it wouldn't be that long at all we're not very specific for instance if we were going to do piano we don't necessarily sit here and go right we're going to do it for this long and we kind of do it on the spot and it's like with the drums as well How's about we try it where you do four of the verse as an intro, then four, yeah. then the chorus, yeah. then, then four, four, then the chorus, then that. Then the third, I would play Colin a brief movement and say, you know, I want this to kind of really move and in big slabs. Because it's hard for me personally if I have an idea for like a more complicated string movement. And then it's quite complicated because Colin has to make sense of it and notate it and then play it back to me. So I can say, you know, I'm going to hear something high here and it takes a long time. So hang on, this is four. Yeah, so as long as I don't particularly have to sing over all of them, because you, you're just adding oh, verses. It's only got two verses in it, isn't it?
That's really good. Oh, that's really good. We've done that straight away the piano. piano that one. Once again? That sounded alright without the piano. I was going to say, frankly, we'd have done that straight away. That'd be like. That's just one point where I'm, I know I was out of the piano. I don't know if I was out that's of the click or not. Mm-hmm. On the kick drum. Bonk. Right. If it's no, just a kick, don't think the way you think that there is. Such, such, such. The work I do with Dakota Suite varies greatly from the, the other kind of things that I do. Um, I mean, I've been doing this a long time now, playing in you know countless bands. Um, but Dakota Suite's music is quite unique to anything else that I'd, I've ever done, or you know, at all really. It's just um, it takes a certain I think kind of sensitivity as a as a drummer to play the songs, you know, the way Chris wants them, the way he hears them, you know. I, I just think that I, I kind of hear them the same way as him, hopefully. I feel like all the things that I write are all soundtracks to a feeling I've had or to something I've seen or like the song Riverside that's on Signal Hill. I remember my friend John, my closest friend, um, John ringing me up in the morning and he was having trouble with his with his partner and um, they weren't getting on very well and he told me a story of something that happened that morning that was so distressing to him that he would phone, he phoned me and told me all about it and I found it so sad. Um, and he said to me, he said, Chris, I really feel like I'm breaking up inside. I can't stand this any longer. And that phrase, I feel like I'm breaking up inside, just stayed with me. And I, I, I and I had that. I had the little guitar. I, again, I went to the guitar and I played the guitar. And it was just, are you breaking up inside? Is it true? Are you breaking up inside? And then I went to the house a week later and I just sat up on the train bridge and recorded the train going by because I imagined him being sorrowful and the train, the early morning train going by, and I have this horrible image of him on his own, which makes me feel really tearful. spend a lot of time here just in the dunes and in sitting in the grass just thinking and being on my own and wondering what was happening and we take a lot of pictures here for artwork because Joe and I both have similar feelings about the sea which is that we love the way it envelops you and, and it's nice and soft and but then if you hit if you kind of jump in it from a big enough distance it's like concrete and the fact that it kind of like it's soft and it laps at your feet but also it's it eats away at the land and destroys things For me, Joe's like the fifth member of the band with the, with the way the things look and the feel of the record. So Johanna has to go out and take something because she knows what I'm feeling at that time. She always takes something that just sums up where we are, like the river that only brings poison. That, that picture of the, the ice floating on the, the, the water was really important because it was, things seem to be calm on the surface, but underneath there's torrents and undercurrents and it's destructive.
and then it was David who sent me the title, This River Only Brings Poison. I just thought, that is so how I see my life. I just bring poison and unhappiness to people. For me, Dakota Suite is like my diary. Every little record just sums up a period of time in my life, and so the artwork and the words and even the titles, everything has to be right, and because it, it has to conjure up the feeling of the time and uh, what I was going through. So for me, I don't see it as like a band or a music project. I see it almost like an installation. Throughout the whole period of making music, I've always worked the like social work jobs. From when I was 15, I've always wanted to work with offenders, which is what I do now. And so I feel like my whole life has been building towards working with people who are in jail and whose lives are obviously quite ruined. I've worked with mental health and I've worked with kids leaving care. And I've always felt like, to me, the work I do is much more important than the music I make because the most important thing in my life, apart from my kids and my wife, is my work because it gives me fulfillment and I feel like when I die, my records won't matter. What will matter to me is the hundreds, if not thousands of people that I will have spent time with and to whom I gave everything that I could to help them see things slightly differently and maybe I'd help them along in some way. It is a very painful thing most days. The song is a very cheery song <clears throat> about a boy that received a small package of joy and when he opened it up it made him happy. Actually it's not about anything to do with that. It's called I Can Feel Your Disease. Playing live for me is not a pleasant experience in any way. We've kind of stopped doing it now because I just can't stand it anymore. I'm just repulsed by the whole experience because I just think, I'm this clown up here reliving this deeply painful experience. Nobody cares about that, nobody knows about that. And I'm up here killing myself and feeling really miserable. So that when I'm playing them, it's like, oh, I remember this time, this was bad. And that's why I end up shouting and screaming quite a lot.
I feel like I'm a prisoner of my world and my experiences. I feel like I'm a prisoner of my regrets and the things that I can't escape. The things that everybody else, and more than likely, the people that are actually the subject of my songs have years ago forgotten about, but I just can't quite seem to let go of and that hurt me. And I feel like for so long, I was even mute for times where I couldn't speak about it because it was so painful, whereas now, I feel like I can at least express things. I'm a very rigid person in the sense that I have my routines and I can't deviate from them because to deviate from them is painful. Um, not that anybody really understands what I'm saying because I'm speaking really quickly, but this song is called Signal Hill and uh, Signal Hill is a place that I went to to try and kill myself after things went badly wrong about seven years ago. Um, it's a really good place to go and try and die. It's in California, just south of Los Angeles. Really big hill, you can see the ocean. It's lovely. I recommend you all try it sometime. Well, not as the case maybe. It's like every day I have to have to remind myself I'm not in that place anymore, but I still feel like I can't get out of that mindset and that way of feeling. And I'm constantly trying to push and find a way out of it and I can't really do that. Your sad eyes tell me there is no I'm just this guy standing to the side of the window just peering out where nobody can see me in the dark. That's the way I feel about the world is that I'm, I'm really not sure about it and I'm not sure about my interactions with the people and I'm almost quite afraid of people talking to me or being with other people because I'm just not sure about things. Suite, tengo más que ver con las connotaciones americanas de su sonido. Eso es algo anímico más que estilístico, es decir, que se mueven en las mismas coordenadas emocionales. What's
believe I tried to kill myself. My wife was so steady, un unswerving in her love for me, and I was putting her through very difficult experiences, and it was like she never blinked. I would hate to think that um, anybody felt that we have an unhappy marriage because of the songs I write. Like if I write a lyric that says, um, like Sweet Swell I Saw is like, oh hey can you see all the rain falling down around our bed, it suggests unhappiness. But my wife's always been the most constant thing in my life and, and I would hate for anybody to think that I'm, I'm unhappy with her because I'm not, I never have been. I don't know where I end and where she starts and I feel like she's just meshed into my side. When she goes out, I feel like she's turning my life off until she gets back. I'm just gonna pick that up, isn't it? Can you hear that? I feel lucky to be just sitting here and having my two kids and having my, my relationship with my wife because I could not have had it, I could have lost it. I always felt like I was still alone. I loved her, but I, there were periods where I wouldn't speak for whole days. And I, I was still myself in my own little world. But as soon as Jacob came along, it was like, I finally looked up from the floor and went, wow, there's a whole world out here. I've never noticed it. And having Ira as well has really helped me along, but uh, it hasn't affected my songwriting because I just have a world of regret. I've got enough to keep me going. It's like people say, oh, I know, you go to the depths of despair and bring me a song, bring me memory back, you know, so I don't have to do it. But that's not very, that's not very fair on people. So, and people change, you know, and um, I don't think that I'll make many more records because I don't want to have to continually revisit the same memory. If I've written a song about something, I'm not going to write another one. That's it, that's done. So I feel like I'm now coming to a position where I think I've written about that and now that time is gone. So... I think this last, this next record, if we, if we ever do make one, if I can stomach to put one out, I think it might be the last one that I write. Certainly vocal stuff, because I feel like I'll have closed that chapter. Sometimes